Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in uh, June 2023. And we've got Mike, who is going to take us into the dark side, the Star Wars analogy here, uh, on taking DevOps tooling to the dark side. Although I don't think it's the dark side of the force, but uh, uh, it's about making us more secure. Oh, over to you, Mike. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for having me today. Um, as you said, I'm going to talk today about uh, taking your DevOps tools to the dark side. Um, got to got to throw in a classic Star Wars reference whenever I can. So, uh, but today, more specifically, I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, how to leverage zero trust networking uh, with your DevOps tools, uh, specifically uh, uh, OpenZ um, as the as the tool that we're, we're interacting with. Okay. Slides advance here. All right. Um, so, just a little bit of background on who I am. Um, I've done a mix of software development, yep. um, sure. DevOps, and uh, site reliability for about the last 14 years or so. Um, started in software development and infrastructure monitoring. Uh, if any of you guys are familiar with a tool called Nagios, um, I actually started there um, doing uh, support and development, um, automation, things like that. Uh, and then from there, I moved on to um, some more software development and CI CD. Uh, I was on a DevOps team of two members where we supported CI CD for 100 developers. Uh, as you might guess, we were not bored. It kept, kept things interesting and moving quickly. Um, and then uh, from there, I moved on to, to actually build a site reliability department um, and, a, and a NOC department from the ground up uh, at, a, um, at about a billion dollar company um, and able to stand that up. And then uh, currently at, at my current place, NetFoundry, um, I, I lead our DevOps team. We call it our RAV team for reliability, automation, and visibility. Um, and that's everything from supporting our public API platform and its reliability, um, CI, CD, all your kind of standard DevOps stuff. Uh, I also do quite a bit with um, analytics, real-time data, data warehousing. Uh, somehow, uh, somehow got roped into business analytics as well. Um, I'm a total data geek. Um, so any anytime I have opportunity to work with uh, real time data and analytics, I'll, I'll jump on that as well. Um, classic startup culture. So um, I, uh, I still wear many many hats. I've been been at my current company about six years, and and definitely still really enjoy it. So, um, so I mentioned uh, the concept of zero trust networking, and I wanted to kind of level set on uh, when when I use that phrase, what what I'm talking about uh, because it's. It's a term that's been marketed pretty heavily, and I think it's been polluted pretty heavily. Um, and so, wanted to kind of um, just paint a picture of it, um, so that we kind of, at least for the rest of the presentation, we kind of uh, we're all on the same page with it. So, um, a lot of our traditional network security is based around kind of this this model on the left, where it is a perimeter based defense. It's it's kind of like you are um, your 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 important information, your important systems, they are um, uh, safely encapsulated inside of your castle walls, which is your firewalls or your security group rules or your, your network ACLs and so forth. And um, you put your you put your security around the outside of the system, and as long as everything's safe inside your fortress, um, you're good. Your systems are safe. Your systems are secure. In a zero trust networking world, uh, we actually start with the assumption that the network itself is already compromised. So. Uh, it's the assumption that enemies are already inside of your walls, and um, we we really can't even trust anything inside of the perimeter uh, because we we would assume that something is already compromised. Um, it definitely changes the way you think about security and uh, about um, locking down your systems and about what uh, what ports you would expose, uh, things like that, and uh, just gives you a different different uh, mindset in terms of how you approach security. Um, the reason that uh, reason I bring this topic up too is that um, I have a lot of conversations with people using traditional networking methods for securing systems. It's it's um, IPs and ports in terms of managing access controllable things. And um, what I, what I would propose too is as we continue to move more and more towards clouds, more and more towards ephemeral systems, um, you know, Kubernetes clusters, service discovery, things like that. Systems are ephemeral; they're coming and going more and more people are remote. Uh, at this point, you know, I, I, I've been I've been fully remote for six years um, during COVID. So many more people went remote and needed secure access to systems, but they're working from pretty much any location and you could never guarantee where they're going to be at. Um, the, this idea of using IPs and ports to, to um, securely manage your systems and manage access successfully um in my opinion this is no longer keeping up with the way with where the industry is going and the way people are actually doing their work um and the kind yeah, of this mike, mike just just maybe a quick, a quick comment that yeah 
the other thing that is also critical is the fact that it means that, for example, on instance response and in monitoring, this gums up the whole thing. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember when this started, you, they go to a system going, so what happens when over a period of time, you, we actually have, you know, these guys had, you know, it was like 5,000, 10,000 containers. It's like, but we don't have 5,000 containers, right? What we have is we have containers coming up and down and every single one of them has a, you know, yep. a unique name, right? So I think it's also not just for instance response, but like, as you monitor, as you understand what's going on, you're, you have this elasticity Right yep. in in your network, um, yep. which is which is important, which is a good and a bad thing, right? Because it scales a lot, but it means that a lot of, like I said, all methods of access control are just more practical. Yep, yep. And, and you think about too with dynamic systems too, just the the complexity of that too of trying to track it and stay on top of it and things like that. Um, uh, you know, VPNs, ACLs, things like that, all that stuff just gets infinitely more complex the more and more that you start to scale out your system and as more people start to move towards, um, you know, microservice architecture, things like that. It, it's, the, the complexity grows very, very quickly. Um, I, you know, we've, we've talked with network administrators to where they kind of will say, they're like, yeah, we, truthfully, we don't, we don't know because <laughs> their, their rule sets have gotten so complex. They're like, we think we got it, but tr truthfully, we don't, we don't know. Um, and that, that becomes the scary part is when it, the complexity increases so high that um, they uh, the, the network engineers themselves are not confident in, in, you know, their, how, how hardened the systems are. Um, I think another concept I've seen, because I, I work in, um, in AWS, AWS space quite a bit, um, this this concept of peering your networks together. Um, you've got people who are going from on-prem to in-cloud or they start in the cloud or, and they realize they need to go multi-region or even multi-cloud and things like that. Then you get into this world of, of peering your data centers together. Um, a thing that I see too is that, um, you know, people will say, you know, it, is it, you know, somebody once asked me, is it is it zero trust to do v VPC peering? And I would say absolutely not because essentially you're just going off of whatever the weakest link is. Um, if your um, security restrictions are looser in one VPC, that that is the weakest link. You've got them linked together. And the thing is, the the most common way people are getting into systems, it's just an old school scan and exploit. It's not hard to do. Yep. Um, it is basically let's just go look for open ports and find who's got systems that are out of date. You know, and if you get a zero day exploit, you know how fast are you at getting that patched in deployment? Um, you know, we we saw one um, recently that within our company a couple of years back, it was a zero day. And we had everything patched within 24 hours, but we already had systems yeah. that were compromised within that time because it is it's not it's not difficult and it's it's uh, you know just about anybody can do it yeah, for absolutely. a scan and exploit attack. So, um, so when you but, hear me, but this is why can you go back just once? Yeah, can, can you go back one slide? Yeah, because I think you see the the other the other I think big pattern is this idea that. For example, people say, well, on the left, mainly on the left, is that you have to protect everything, right? So the attackers only have to find one little way in. Once they're in, they go in there, right? And and in a way, that's reasonably correct because once you're inside that private VPC, you have access to everything, right? And and I always felt that that's that does show that the balance of power is with the attackers, right? That's they they you know they can attack all the time. They have to find it. We have to protect everything. They have to do all the stuff. Where the model I like is more the model on the right, where what what we want is a security model that is based on the attacker making a mistake. So it's kind of like you, we have to assume that there will be a zero day into one of those boxes. So, yep. but although they might be able to get to that ones in red on the right, it doesn't make them invisible. You know, it doesn't mean that they were able to now be completely, you know, sort of, you know, invisible inside the organization. So if we know what good looks like, we know that, hold on, that box in the middle should never call the box up. Right, that's a really weird. Or you know, since when my 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 N nginx Docker container is now doing a port scan across my <laughs> my Kubernetes cluster? Do you know what I mean? Yep. So so I, I feel that that that's again some of the side effects of the more we understand how the thing work, the more we can pick up on those um, little mistakes that the attacker do, which fundamental is doing something that normally doesn't happen. The yep. question is, can we detect that? And and you know in terms of in terms of the inevitable change that's coming, a, a piece that um, I want to kind of start to imprint in people's minds too is just if you have an open port, start to think of that from a security standpoint. Is if you have an open port, period, that is bad on some level. 
Um, it just it, it, it is an entry point. And, and so when, when you're going to hear me use the phrase, make it dark, um, the idea is going to be, all right, let's get those ports closed. And I'm going to show you how to create connect, connectivity without doing any open ports before this uh, presentation is over. All right, so yeah, so this concept of make it dark. First and foremost, stop leaving ports open to the entire internet. Wherever you're doing that, if it is all possible, shut them down, close them down. But also stop leaving your ports open to your entire data center, your entire VPC, your entire subnet. Um, again, these are gaping security holes that uh, are, are letting attackers in very, very easily. Again, with a simple scan and exploit attack, that's all they need. Um, stop with the peering. If you if you don't have to, if you don't need to, and I'll show you a way that you don't need to. Um, basically, again, it's the weakest link model. Uh, if you leave the weakest link vulnerable, you've left everything vulnerable. And so when you hear me say making it dark, um, this is a security model that where you don't have to have any ingress at all. Um, you can have a firewall rules that is simply deny all or a security group that is deny all inbound. Um, and so, so this is similar to sort of a Kubernetes deployment model, correct? It, where in, you in create a, the services be, yeah. as a pattern, right? As a pattern. Yeah, there, there are, um, there are Kubernetes um, toolings that are going to, that are allow you to do some of this where you can create connectivity policy um the the challenge with those is that they are within a within a, a kubernetes cluster um, when you start getting to where you have multiple clusters or you have resources outside of that it gets it gets more difficult um and um it, with uh well i'll kind of go through with OpenZD. we'll be showing you a way that is it's it's somewhat agnostic to uh, what tool you're using. So if you're in AWS Fargate, or if you're in Kubernetes, or if you have a mix, or if you're a mix of Kubernetes and private data center, you can create connectivity in this way. Um, and you're con controlling all your access through policies. Um, a, a key concept in terms of uh, with OpenZD, it's, it's getting away from um, IPs and ports as your way to create connectivity. And it's breaking everything down to where you either have services or identities. And it might be um, I might need to access uh, my data warehouse, um, and that is a service. It, you know, it is something that it does have a um, an address at the end of the day, um, but ultimately that's a a service. And we just create an abstract and say, okay, the data warehouse is a service, and Mike Guthrie is an identity. But even more than that, Mike Guthrie's laptop is an identity, and Mike Guthrie's cell phone is an identity. My laptop yeah. might need to access it, but my cell phone really doesn't. And so I can actually get that granular and specific with the access and say what specifically truly mm -hmm. needs to access this. And, and that's like a concept of zero trust, right? It's about who you are, what you have, where you come from, you yep. know, what, what you need, what you're going to, and all of that then determines if you can access that thing or if you, or whatever that is, can access yep. that resource versus here's a username and password that can connect to it. That's it, right? Yep, cool. that's exactly right. So then, so in this kind of world, when I say, okay, there's no more ingress, you know, how in the world do do things actually connect and talk to each other? Um, so I want you to imagine, uh, so in the middle of this diagram, we've got uh, the OpenZD fabric. Um, and these these do have public listeners into it. And the way that it, this connectivity works is that everything dials outbound and it'll dial into and establish a persistent connection with this fabric. By default, things are just connected, but nothing has access to each other. They're just they're just simply dialed in, and they're they're awaiting access grants by a policy. And so, if you've got a trusted entity in data center A, um, you can create a policy that says, okay, you know this trusted entity over in data center A, you can talk to the private resource in data center B, um, but you can actually set it up so that there again there is no ingress whatsoever getting into data center B. Uh, or, you know, if it's a security group in AWS, um, you know, name, name your system, but essentially you can have no open ports at all and only outbound is allowed and, and you can create the connectivity between these two systems. Um, me being a DevOps guy, I am a classic troublemaker in the space of security because I always need, I need my systems to connect to everything because we're getting into this world where systems are managing systems. So how do you do that? Well, You've got these automation tools that, of course, break your break your security model, and and you know they got to talk to you know all the all the important systems and all the important places, uh, but of course it's creating a a single attack vector for that. Um, so how do we do that in a way that is safe and 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 
leveraging OpenZD and a zero trust model allows me to create the connectivity I need between systems without ever opening any new ports, without having to create a security exception um, so that um, you know a deployment system or a monitoring system needs to talk where it, with whatever it needs to talk to. Um, again, in this model, so I represented in data center A, let's say you do have a compromised entity um, because there is no way for data center A to communicate with data center B except by zero trust you have not compromised data center B uh, as a result of this. And you're able to create a tighter security model because you're blocking any, any inbound access on your services. So you basically go, go to, you know, the, the OpenZT sort of, you know, almost that becomes like a routing, you mm -hmm. know, path network, right? And then, yep. and that, that's where you enforce the policy. So you can only communicate, you know, through it. Um, kind of, kind of what some of the meshes do inside the clusters, isn't it? Yep. Um, uh, but but you do that across data centers, across application, across networks, isn't it? Exactly right. So yeah. So in, so let's say that um, you know this guy over here, this trusted entity in data center B, is accessing the private service over here, and and you can actually even you know mask and hide the the true name of it too. So if you wanted to give it some just generic dummy name for intercept, you know, if I try to access you know data warehouse is my service name, um, this the um, it's called a tunneler. The ZD tunneler will actually intercept your traffic over on this side and it will route through the fabric and, and route it out so that it, it um, exits and terminates over in this tunneler on this side. Um, and, and, and that's how the traffic gets around. Um, yeah. Crazy. And so, yep. And so there's, and, there, and there's three, there's kind of three different models that, um, that, that can be done. And these of course can be mixed and matched because at, at, at any given time you might have, various levels of controls in terms of how tight you can make this secure access. So um, the top one we just call as a network level access. Um, and that's maybe, to me, that's the weakest model. And it's 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 only a little bit zero trusty to where you basically got, um, uh, we call it an edge router in one data center and an edge router in another. And it basically it's, a, it's allowing um, routers to talk to one another. Um, I kind of discourage this when possible because it's not it's not that much better than creating a VP, VPC peering connection. Well, that's, um, that's yeah, that's just a VPN almost, isn't it? <laughs> just it, it traffic. More or less, yeah. And it's like yeah. some a lot of people will start there, um, and as a way to kind of get it get in the door and, and get people going yeah. with it, um, or like they might have it where um, on one side they've got it to where um, they've got say host specific tunnelers to where, for example, my laptop might have the tunneler installed on it. And then on the other side, you've got um, you've got an edge router to where things can egress the the fabric and, and access private services. That still gives you um, that still gives you the ability to make something dark on one side of the equation. And anytime that you can do that, it's it's you know in as many places as you can. Um, it makes it it makes it better. Um, and you know sometimes we're not able to go complete true zero trust all the way, but even partially to where you can um, close things down to where you can close down open ports makes makes a big difference. So. Um, this the second layer here is what is uh, what we call host access. Um, the idea being, let's say I've got a Linux box on this side, and they've got a tunneler running on it as a, like a systemd service, for example. Um, this host could intercept traffic, and again, it gets routed securely, and then it it um, uh, egresses um, over on another host on the other side. Um, and this could have it to where your firewall rules on both of these are again, you know, deny all inbound. Um, and this can actually terminate on local host on the other side. Um, and, and this is this is a better model to where your traffic is never, um, it, it, once it leaves the host, it is never unencrypted. Um, you're basically terminating on local host over here and you're egressing on, or I'm sorry, you're, you're intercepting on local host over here and then it's terminating on local host on this side. But you could also do this for containers, correct? Mm -hmm. So yep. by um, host, that could be a container. Yep. So this and and with this model, because you could do um, uh, you can actually do a sidecar container um, where the tunneler is running as a sidecar for your service, and it's basically just terminating uh, local host and whatever port your application is serving on. Um, and that's a um, that's one of the models that I that I particularly like because it's very very yeah. easy to implement. So yeah, and it solves the the, the, the massive problem of you know Kubernetes. You know, let's take clusters where it's Kubernetes or others equivalent, right? They inside the cluster every Container usually has access to the other containers, which is yep. a massive you know, again yep. back back into the world where everything, you know, your world garden is just things. So uh, that that is a really good way. Again, if you control by policies, then it allows you to be a lot more scalable from a security yep. point of view. Yep, exactly. 
And then, and then the last one that is um, more more unique to OpenZD is that um, you can actually leverage the OpenZD SDKs and do a fully app embedded implementation to where your um, your connectivity requests across services is actually happening inside of your application. So you're actually establishing your connectivity um, from one application to another. Um, that's where in, in an implementation like that, you actually don't have any tunnelers running at all. It's actually their application code itself is establishing the connection and talking to an application on the other side. Um, this, this for us in terms of what we kind of communicate is this is the the best model for for zero trust because you never have a possibility of your traffic being intercepted um, it's going directly from application to another application um, and there's no additional processes that need to be running but you ne you never have a time where your traffic is unencrypted not even on the local box um, and so you remove all possibility of intercept because your traffic is encrypted 100 percent of the way from application to application and so, and, and and like I said, you can you can mix and match these. So you could have it where um, you're you know embedding it on you know say a, a Python script on one side, and you're doing a a uh, um, sidecar container on the other side. Um, but the, the idea is to try and create that layer, create that um, you know kind of zero trust box of encryption. Have it go as far as it can go to the ultimate destination. The 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 farther you can reach it in towards that application. The less opportunity you have for traffic being intercepted, uh, again, the more secure your model is going to be as you're as you're creating connectivity across your systems. Yep, absolutely. Cool. So, the, the reason I care about this, and I'll you know full disclaimer, I'm not a network engineer, um, and uh, I'm certainly not a sales guy either. I am a get it done DevOps guy, and um, you know for for me. At the end of the day, I need to get my job done. And usually at any given time, there's two or three people waiting on me to get something done. So I need to be able to move quickly um, without creating significant compromises in our security model. Um, and the, the challenge in the DevOps space is that almost every DevOps tool that is used is somehow, um, it is somehow a high value target for, uh, for an attacker. Um, and I'll kind of go through a list because these are all tools that I commonly use, but basically they are, if, 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 if this is a system that can be compromised, it's just an absolute jackpot for an attacker. Um, CICD, it is a code injection system that's going to put code in, and run it in all of the places that matter in your infrastructure. Um, it's fantastic attack vector. Um, you know, infrastructure monitoring, again, it's, it's, it's remote agents collecting data, reporting them all back to a central place, but it's basically a data mining platform. Um, you know, can you compromise, you know, the system that is managing the agents? Can you compromise um, the, the central place where all that data is being collected? You've got something creating inventory and collecting critical information about um, all systems that matter in your infrastructure. Um, ETL jobs, again, it's, it's gathering data from all your critical data sources, but somehow they got to have access to those systems to go crawl the data and bring it all back to a central place. Data warehouse. It's a place where all that data is already conveniently gathered for an attacker. Um, config management. We think about your Ansible, your Salt. Um, again, you, you're creating one place where uh, a single person or a single single bad actor could take down the entire infrastructure or just simply compromise the whole infrastructure. Uh, because these systems, by nature, they've got uh, you know root level access to things in order to do what they need to do. Um, all these automation tools, they're fantastic. They're amazing. They allow systems to administrate systems, but they create an incredible attack vector that um, that attackers know they need that they know they need to compromise. And I think that we've seen this in the industry where a lot of the really, really big hacks that have happened in the last, in the last few years, they're going after these DevOps tools because they're just a fantastic way into the entire infrastructure or many people's infrastructure. Uh, because of just the nature. By the of way, man, you should add to these the security tools. <laughs> yeah, you should yeah. add to here the security tools, which can be as bad as yeah. everything you got in here, right? Well, Massive and, crown jewels. And and the thing that I've come across and observed too is like, um, you know, I've, I've been in places where you have to you have a security audit, um, and me being a DevOps person, typically it's your production application that is subject to that security audit. And what I ask people, especially in the DevOps space, is you know, would you would you feel comfortable turning that auditor loose or turning that pen tester loose on your Jenkins machine or on your monitoring, you know, on your monitoring infrastructure in the same way that you would your production application? You know, we at at any given point, you know, people will 
they'll kind of they have to draw a line of scope around those audits and say okay this is this is what our the scope of this audit will entail they typically are not putting their devops stuff inside of that scope um, unless they have very very tight security restrictions and what what I would encourage people to start thinking of is, is it's like, I mean, yeah, you, you've done all your hardening on your production application, but have you done the same amount of rigor around your DevOps tools? And too often that is not the case because people are trying to move fast. They're trying to get their jobs done and they're going to potentially run looser on that because um, you've got operators that need to access a lot more systems again, because somebody's always waiting on them. They got to get their job done. So what do they do? They're going to make compromises in order to um, try to get done what they need to get done. And, what I'm proposing by leveraging open uh, um, zero trust networking, leveraging open ZD is that this creates a way that you can continue to move fast, but you're not breaking your security model. You're not introducing um, all sorts of new pathways into your system and the tools themselves. You can lock them down way, way tighter than what you um, could do otherwise. Um, and, and I think and that's to, a really powerful message that we get to the point where you know, this, this kind of techniques and stuff and, and workflows actually makes teams go faster. Actually, yeah. this is not just about making more secure, which is important, but this also allows us and also, you know, the teams to go faster, to be more compliant, but also it cleans up a lot of the stuff that they want to do. In fact, prevents bugs in the future. There's crazy amount of benefits from this in terms, yep. not just from security. And, and, and for me, where, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm probably no different than any other DevOps tool or DevOps engineer where I've got my strong opinions about what tools I like and why I like them. I tend to like tools that can act as a Swiss army knife. And basically I can get, I can have a lot of runway with them. They let me solve a lot of problems while maintaining a reasonably concise set of tools. Um, and um, it was actually, so, so we, um, my company actually develops OpenZD. I'm not an OpenZD developer. I support the platform side, but we were encouraged to to dog food it and start using it internally. And my, uh, you know, I was admittedly I was a bit reluctant upfront um, because my, um, you know, my experience has, has often been it's like okay, we're going to lock the system down. <laughs> Inevitably, that means all right, we're going to break a ton of stuff and we're going to create a lot of friction while we while we start to secure the system and tighten things down and. Uh, what I actually found was that um, not only was it fairly fairly trivial to begin to secure systems, but it it um, it did actually enable me to move more quickly because because I didn't have to um, I didn't have to you know uh, create any new security exceptions. I didn't have to open any new uh, firewall ports or anything like that to create connectivity because that that's a key piece of what we do in DevOps is we create connectivity between systems. We wire things together and being able to do that without breaking the security model um, was was a huge deal. And so um, and I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit on, on my slides, but um, the very first thing that we did internally was our data warehouse. Um, we had um, our, our data warehouse was it was it had an open port to the Internet and it was just a simple set of credentials that somebody could more or less brute force to get in. And that was keeping me up at night. And there were reasons that it we, we had it that way. Um, at least early on. And uh, that was the one thing I'm like, okay, we're going to lock something down. I need to get that thing locked down. So we started there um, and it started with, you know, just end user access to data warehouse. Um, and, um, and then from there, we went to the ETL runners because they needed to reach out to various databases to go, um, to go gather data and pull it into the data warehouse. And um, again, I was expecting a lot of friction and a lot of breakage. Um, but what was what was nice about it is that um, you know in addition to creating it where you're, you've got your services and your identities, your services can be a completely made up name, um, but your service can also be um, an at the actual address of um, of the destination service. And so what we actually did is I, I just used the actual addresses as the intercept. And what it allowed me to do is that as I began implementing this in systems that were not greenfield, they were they were already running and already working. Um, is that before I turned off all the ports, I said, okay, you know, start your start your intercept and route over ZD. And I was actually able to validate that everything was working before we locked everything down. And so it made the migration path actually really straightforward because I could watch by, um, I could verify by seeing the traffic for various identities go over the network and say, okay, I can see that this identity has been using this for two weeks. Nobody's complained to me that it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're probably good that we can, uh, we can begin to lock this down. And so, um, that was a pattern that seemed to work pretty well. So once once we got through the data warehouse, we continued on with our CI/CD system. So like all of our end user access to any of our DevOps tools at this point 
um, it is all managed through through ZD. So they are not um, these these ports are not exposed. Um, there um, there's no access to these tools unless you're using Open ZD um, and unless you have a trusted identity that's been issued access through a policy. Um, but even you know beyond end user access, um, and, and what's what's nice about the end user access is again it doesn't matter where you're at. If you're in a coffee shop, if you're remote, if you're at, a, at an office location, um, the access works regardless of your location, because again it's just a world of services and identities. It doesn't care what your IP is. It doesn't care where you're coming from, um, because it's already saying no. You're an identity. I know you. I trust you, and you've been you've been granted access to this. So regardless of your location, you can still access the uh, uh the private systems uh, i think so we went through um uh, let's see we did an app embedded implementation in, or, so yeah, modernmost is really interesting right mm -hmm. so because modernmost allows you to deploy private uh service correct yep correct. so so you, you're almost able to then have yeah you, you remove the dependency on slack especially mm -hmm. for some isolated solutions but okay. then you still have the benefit of having chat ops isn't it Correct. Yep. And so we uh, we have that internally. So the only way you're able to get to our company uh, company chat is through OpenZD. So um, so you, you know, this, and there's still the authentication of the applications and things like that too. But this is basically you don't even have you don't have network access to this thing um, without being granted trust through OpenZD. Yep. And so for um, and, and and for for each Mattermost was actually our first kind of internal dog fooding thing. Is is <laughs> And again, there was admittedly, even for myself, there was some skepticism where I'm like, wait, you're going to like, we're a remote company. You're going to take our chat platform and we're going to put it up put it on open ZD and, 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 and lock it down and so forth. But uh, we've been running like that for, I want to say probably three years now. Um, and that, that is our, um, that is our company communication platform that, that we use. And um, it's been, it's, it's worked great. And, and yeah, we run our own Mattermost servers and, and everything else. And it's all just run over open ZD. Um, I think the uh, yeah I won't I won't read off the slides, but the uh, the last one too that has kind of become my um, my new favorite uh, is the developer access and support access model. Um, I think if you've ever been in the situation where you have to manage developer or support team member access, there's always a certain degree of discomfort because you're never able to get it quite as granular as you would like. Um, you've got you know one developer that they might be responsible over. Um, you know, for example, they might they might be responsible over the billing platform, but you don't want to grant them access to all these other systems over here, or vice versa. You don't want to um, grant these access develop. You know, you don't want to gr grant these developers access to where they would have have access to a billing database, for example. Um, the the thing that's nice is that you can start to take um, things like developer access and support access and make them really really granular, so that um, an individual person, they just have an attribute that gives them access to the very, very specific things. Um, you can, I mean, you can get not just down to the to the node, but down to the port level and say you have access to this port, but not to this port uh, within a within a system. Uh, in terms in terms of how that access is managed, um, I like to. I, I came from a place where we used to do Active Directory management. Uh, we used you know group associations to determine access. Um, it's the same kind of concept, except for um, at a network layer. Um, where you're assigning network access based on kind of attributes that that identity will have or not have. And so, for example, uh, on the left here, this is a, this is a policy that I've got. Um, a NetFoundry referred to them as AppWans, but in OpenZD, it's a service policy. Um, and it's as simple as saying, okay, services that are tagged with the attribute data warehouse, um, they uh, can talk to endpoints that are tagged with data warehouse. So how does somebody have access to those services? Um, and, and endpoint is on the right. I just have a, a demo endpoint that I created for myself. And, and you can see that it's like, okay, one of the attributes that my test endpoint has is data warehouse. Um, and basically uh, when I come online, I just will magically inherit access to those services um, and I can access what I need to. And you can get really specific and granular in terms of how you break these things into, into policies and groups. Um, and it depends. And, and, and you can do things like in terms of the terminating um, things, you can do port ranges and things like that too. But um, it's, as, it's, as, um, it's as broad or as granular as you want it to be or as you need it to be. Um, and so, but for, for me personally, I really like the granularity of it because it lets me get more specific um, because I, I do oversee um, a lot of our support and developer access and, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to break that down into models that make sense. But this is just a UI to help create it, isn't it? Everything mm -hmm. will end up on uh, a file that is managed by Git, by policy. 
It's, it's um, yeah, so OpenZD has a, uh, called a ZD controller, uh, where it basically maintains a, a, an internal database. And all these can be, these can all be done programmatically through, um, through API as well. Um, this, uh, again, this is just the UI that, um, that can be used. I use this for visual representation, but yeah, all of this is, is completely programmable as well. So even if you wanted to do, um, like if you wanted to do time-based access, um, you could do a thing where um, programmatically you could set it up and say, hey, you know, let me let me file something. I need support access to this system for an hour. Um, you could programmatically set up automation to say, okay, grant them this attribute for the hour. When the hour is done, revoke it again. Uh, you can you can get it to that level with it too, where it's all it's it's uh, it's all programmatic and you can control it that way. Because uh, OpenZD is also very much an API first uh, implementation as well. So. Very cool. Um, let's see. Actually, end up talking about most of this already, but um, yeah, like I said, when we were encouraged to dog food, my my reaction was very skeptical. Um, at least at least up front, in terms of you know how much how much friction it was going to cause, and and very quickly I became to where I was adopting OpenZD as one of my DevOps tools because it solved the real problem for me of being able to create the connectivity between systems, um, and um, and be able to do it very, very quickly without introducing more friction, without um, compromising a security model. Um, the other thing that's, um, that I liked in particular, because I'm also a total data geek as well, was, uh, um, you know, at a previous place, I had a scenario where uh, we had to, we had to let an employee go and they, and, and they asked, you know, hey, can you, can you see what they've been accessing? And of course, we didn't have any good solution. So you spend like three days sifting through logs and ultimately you're like, I don't think so, but you really have no idea. Um, what's nice in, in this zero trust model too, is because we, um, at least with, um, with cloud ZD, we, we track, we track all the traffic as well. And we preserve that too. So we could actually see, it's like, okay, if I'm curious, Hey, is anybody even using this service? I can actually see down to the identity, which, you know, which identities are accessing the service, how much traffic are they passing? When are they accessing it? Things like that. And because, um, everything is funneled through open ZD and, and especially for all the end user access, we know. Oh yeah, this person was was on the production database yesterday. What were they doing and things like that? We can see those things. Um, Have you very, done very easily now? Do you know a use case of feeding that data to a sim, for example, and starting to have and also giving the instance response team the ability to monitor that and to start to detect those access that shouldn't have access? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit like sometimes it's hard to lock certain things down, but if we can at least monitor using like this, then we can say, look, we might not be able to lock it all down, but at least we'll be able to figure out very quickly if somebody or something is already accessing stuff that it should not be able to access. Yeah. So uh, have you seen examples where it gets fed to some, some of the scene providers out there? It, it uh, well, yeah, because we do internally, because I, uh, I work on supporting the, uh, um, the, the hosted, the hosted OpenZD basically, which is uh, Cloud ZD. And what we do, we actually feed it to Elasticsearch uh, for that purpose, and that's that's what powers the graphs in our in our console and so forth. But somebody else could do something very very similar, where they they send it to a sim, or they could send it to, um, you know, th their own Elastic Elasticsearch or equivalent. Because what um, and and this is actually one of the things that I got to be a part of um, being at NetFoundry, which was exciting to me being a data geek, was that. For, for every byte that gets passed over OpenZD, it gets attributed back to a specific network session, um, which ultimately it, it attributes to um, a, an initiating identity, um, a hosting identity, um, and the service that was accessed. And so for with those three dimensions, the, the, the power of what you're able to um, actually track with that is really incredible. So you, you always know you know who's who's accessing what services, how often, and, and you can look at it from any of those directions. And so uh, the the data that you get from OpenZD is actually really really powerful from a, a trackability standpoint as well. Yep, very cool. But yeah, so it, um, that that's what I had at least for the presentation. But if uh, if you're curious about OpenZD, want to see more about it, um, it's 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 open source. It's on GitHub, um, and uh, there's additional documentation there, and then, uh, as I mentioned, I, so I, I I work for for NetFoundry, and we we provide a cloud hosted OpenZD uh, platform. Um, and there is a Teams plan if people want to just try it out and, and tinker with it for free. That's free up to um, that's free up to 10, uh, 10 identities um, that you can test it out and just kick the tires on it. It gives you a little more like user friendly way if you want to approach it from more uh, like console first type of uh, perspective. But um, 
Yes, let's leave it open for yeah. questions, comments, anything like that. No, no, very cool. And look, I, I, these days I, I'm a big fan of these open source projects where you have a fundamental open source base, which allows you to scale, allows to have the openness, allows to have the, you know, almost like a much more transparent way of, of governance, but then have a corporate organization that actually supports that. Uh, yeah. Because especially from a, a corporate point of view, like some of these, you need somebody who's going to maintain the SLAs, who's going to maintain the service, you know, getting this to work, you know, this becomes a, a key dependency, but uh, you know, it's a really powerful model. And yeah. um, no, no, it's really cool. No, I don't think there's any, I, I've been asking all my questions during, during the session. No, it's, uh, it, it's great. I love I, it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy powerful, man. I, I, I feel some of those use cases are, you know, I think we get to the point where, and, and this is where these days, like my, half of my world now relies on, I'm, I'm getting my head around the whole chat GPT and the whole generative AI. It's, I think, again, this is another example of, I think, a foundational technology that once we can start to really understand our infrastructure, this becomes a lot more real. So imagine, you know, starting to feed network architectures into, for example, a generative AI model that then can spit out some of these policies, can start to maintain some of these things, start to yeah. connect to business owners, starts to analyze that. So, so we almost can make this scale. Because I think in the past, when um, my challenge with a lot of this was like, I love it, but how do I make this scale? How do I get to that point of really streamlining the, the process, especially when you have, you know, hundreds of dev teams right? and they're all freaking mm -hmm. going 100 miles an hour right you know yep. how to do that so i think that this is a good a good example of the kind of technology foundation that basically it's about making sure that a only connects to b and that's it right and yep. especially detection is, is super powerful that that was definitely uh, a challenge i ran into uh, at uh, a previous place when i said it was it was myself and one other devops engineer against 100 developers and yeah. the the thing was that um the speed of innovation for developer teams was always able to outrun the networking um to oh, yeah. where you know you just you just it's just it just moves too fast you can't keep up yeah, with but it. that's and... why the devops movement came along right the devops yep. movement came along because there was an infrastructure team that worked at snail pace right and then yep. the devs up goes dude i can spin up infrastructure faster than it takes me to talk to you and yep. then but then he got to the other end where you know suddenly now the dev team's going freaking shit you know managing networks and managing infrastructure is actually very difficult yeah yep, <laughs> can yep. we bring those guys back in right because actually we need yeah. them because actually the dev team just want to focus on almost the business element of delivering stuff so yeah. um i think but, but again this is a like the new modern way of thinking about this which i think is is crazy powerful no no good stuff um yeah let, let's do a couple more sessions uh, so again I, I think that's i think we you know I'm, I'm going to try to figure out a nice way to split some of these because there's so many great nuggets yeah. on, on here. And then um, let's take it to, you know, uh, maybe have a, a couple of panels where we kind of start talking about more real world usage. I really love that example you had there on, on, um, on, on creating that separate, you know, Slack sort of equivalent environment internally, which actually gives you a lot of resilience. Cause sometimes I worry that if you're an attacker, like you said, but can you hit Slack, or, or hit Confluence or hit Jira, and you basically now destroyed half of the comms of the of the system, right? Yeah. So, yep. so it's quite powerful to have those environments, right? Um, but even you know something as simple as you know the company is, is looking at acquisition. Uh, really, should they be you know should be using the main environments where? Yeah. really you know how can you prevent some of that leakage of information? So I think yep. there's great great use cases that once this becomes almost like normalize, we can really lock down a lot of our environments. So yep. brilliant, man. Uh, awesome. Thanks for doing this. I'll just uh, stop recording and uh, we'll see you next time.